Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Jim Flegging, and I'm from our Menlo Park office. And uh, just a bit about Silicon Valley. You actually don't need a passport. No, no embassies required. We're all uh, we're good people out there. Um, our panel today is going to be discussing, so after OPM, what's next? And uh, as you'll see in a few minutes, we have an outstanding panel to lead that discussion. Uh, just as a bit of backdrop, the federal government has spent billions on cybersecurity, but as repeated breaches, most notably OPM, sort of serve to remind us, what we've invested to date is not adequate. So in terms of looking at this question of what's next, we're going to look at some of the macro issues as it relates to technology, threat, policy. I suspect we're also going to touch on things like hygiene and executive leadership. Um, I know we'll also be hitting some of the, the significant defensive programs, Einstein, CDM, and then we'll touch on some of the other initiatives, some of the policy things like CISA, the Cyber Sprint, and the, I'd love to get some views on the recently announced White House Cybersecurity Implementation Plan. Now, the focus of this is clearly federal government, um, but I think that uh, there will be some very good lessons for industry, and hopefully, particularly for the CEOs. For those of you who've heard me talk about this, I'm really passionate about the fact that we need CEOs on the bus. And uh, CEOs, while they clearly understand the world of risk management, I think through this panel we're going to hit both sides of the coin. Clearly the Im imperative to react to cyber risk, but also the opportunity that organizations can gain by really building cyber trust. So without further ado, let me introduce the panelists, and then each one of these guys is going to say a couple words from an opening. So uh, Kevin, you got the short straw. You were on the other end. So we'll, when we do the intro, start with you and work back. But at the end, Kevin Richards with Accenture Strategy, Ryan Gillis with Palo Alto Networks. Uh, can't see you here, Mark, but Mark Weatherford, a, a senior advisor with the Chertoff Group. And lastly, uh, Brigadier General Greg Tuhill with DHS. So. Uh, Gentlemen, welcome, and thank you for your time. And uh, Kevin, your leadoff hitter. Oh, a couple of comments. You. Well, good morning. Uh, <coughs> good morning. I know, you had the break. I got to interact. It's, it's just part of my thing. So I, I am with Accenture Strategy. I lead our, our North American security practice. Um, Accenture Strategy lives at the world, uh, the intersection of business and technology. My world is the, the collision of security and business and how, how organizations are reacting to the, to the change. Um, my, my purview is both, well, it's actually threefold. Uh, I'm over our, our advanced, our, our, I'm sorry, Accenture Federal Services Group from a security perspective. Uh, also over our, our commercial side, we call our LLP side, helping our, our, our private sector, sector clients. And the third hat is uh, about 20% of my team actually is responsible for protecting Accenture. So it's, it's an interesting, uh, I guess three-way duality if, or triality, if that's a word, of how we manage through this change. And I look at, at, at OPM as, as a, it's certainly interesting from a federal perspective. It's also very indicative of what a lot of our commercial clients are dealing with. Big bad things are happening, and so hopefully we'll spend a fair amount of time on that today of how we can bubble that up, both for the federal world as well as for the private sector. Great, thanks. Ryan Gillis with Palo Alto Networks. Um, I uh, am a government alum, so worked with these guys on the inside, worked for Secretary Chertoff, uh, Secretary Ridge, and Secretary Napolitano. Spent about three years at the National Security Council and came to Palo Alto Networks in, in January of this year. Uh, my role with Palo Alto Networks um, it involves interfacing with companies as well as governments, building operational relationships. So last week we released a, a paper revealing the infrastructure of a ransomware campaign. We were on the phone with the NKIC and the FBI, uh, making sure that they had that information and that we were coordinated so that they could do victim notifications and, and go after the infrastructure. Um, I, I spent a lot of time in, in forums such as these, interfacing and engaging in dialogue so that we are represented in the, the tech community's position and also fostering this public-private dialogue. So looking forward to the discussion today and in particular delving into some of these issues that are, I think, start with a focus on federal government, but as Kevin said, um, are pervasive across industry as well. Um, Mark Weatherford, I am, I am formerly from the Chertoff Group. I do, they still like me a little bit though, so they asked me to stay as a senior advisor. Uh, but I recently joined a small security company in Menlo Park 
Um, v Armor, we are a data center security company doing uh, micro segmentation in virtual networks um, in software defined networking. Um, the most cool thing I've ever seen in technology. Um, I am formerly from DHS, worked with Ryan um, in uh, CSNC at DHS and uh, been a CISO at a number of, number of uh, large organizations. Uh, good morning. I'm Greg Tuhill. I'm a Deputy Assistant Secretary at uh, the Department of Homeland Security. My team uh, runs the NCIC, the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center. And underneath that, we have the United States CERT and the Industrial Control System CERT. And today, I'm here to help uh, contribute to the conversation about cybersecurity, which I view not just as a technology issue, but more appropriately as a risk management issue. And we'll talk about risk later today. All right, thanks, guys. Let's go ahead and get into it. Um, Greg, I've got sort of a broad question for you, I think, which will set the stage for the rest of the panel. Uh, let's start with OPM. First off, what happened here? And then second, can you talk about Einstein? Uh, where are we? What are some of the recent changes? And specifically, where are we with regard to coverage across the government? Sure. Thanks very much. Two questions here. Let's uh, first uh, do a high-level uh, wave top view on OPM. Uh, you know, everything has been put out in the congressional testimony, but a lot of folks haven't invested all the time to see the two hours and 58 minutes on the first session and the three hours on the second session and the like. But here's the bottom line. Uh, we had with uh, OPM, we had a, uh, an adversary set uh, go in through a trusted third party partner and come into the OPM environment looking like a legitimate user and harvesting information. And uh, as a result of some improvements that OPM made at the recommendation of the US CERT who had been in there uh, working and consulting with them in March of 2014, they were able to de uh, detect the activity uh, through some technical uh, measures. Uh, we, as well as some of our partners in the intelligence community, responded uh, to that, uh, that event and uh, did the attack characterization and battle damage assessment with OPM. Uh, at the end of the day, it was, uh, it was a, uh, what I would consider one of the most noteworthy watershed events in cyber history. And it has uh, caused executives in both the public and the private sector to wake up to the fact that this really is a risk management issue. And uh, as part of that conversation, uh, we in my organization continue to work in both the public sector as well as in the private sector to harden up the different systems and better protect information. <clears throat> now, to answer the second question, um, you know, let me give you a quick op ops check as far as where we stand on Einstein. First of all, Einstein is also known by its uh, budgetary name, which is uh, NCPS, the National Cybersecurity Protection System. And Einstein actually comes in three flavors. The first flavor is state-of-the-art 25-year-old technology uh, called NetFlow. <laughs> you know, basically, we're taking a look at the bits and bytes that are going back and forth. And like Stephen Covey, the noted uh, management expert, said, you know, you measure the unusual, so we're looking for traffic anomalies and other stuff that cue us in that something's, you know, one of these things is not like the other. So when we see something unusual, we work with the security operations centers in the different departments and agencies. And oh, by the way, we have over 120 independently owned and operated franchises within the federal government that are running their own systems. Einstein 2 is intrusion detection where we take that NetFlow data, we compare it against known indicators of compromise, hashes, IP addresses, URLs, uh, uh, email addresses, and the like that we, are, we know have been uh, leveraged by uh, bad actors. And we bounce that off, and then we, if we see something, we say something. We get alerts, we share that with the security operations centers so that we can do a deeper dive to do a, an assessment. That's probably state-of-the-art technology from 22 years ago. <laughs> Einstein 3 is uh, really where we needed to be about 15 years ago, and that's what we're rolling out right now. And that's intrusion protection. Because wouldn't it be cool if you see something, you can block it before it gets in or out? 
and that's really where we're going with uh, Einstein 3. And we've actually moved the defensive perimeter from the base gate, as it were, where we have Einstein 1 and 2, out to the highway. And that's with the internet service providers. And we've been working with our internet service providers to federal agencies to install this intrusion protection capability at that gateway out there at the ISP. That's Einstein 3A. And as of last night, we were up to 49% of the federal government uh, having that installed through the ISPs. And uh, we are hopeful that within the next year, we're going to get that up into the 80s with uh, more and more ISPs uh, rolling that out. And then once, of course, the ISPs roll out, there is, in fact, an install that needs to be done at the departments and agencies. So we're making progress on that. However, in my personal view, uh, we're, we're, a little late, we're late to need on this capability. And that, you know, that's all on the boundary, though. We also had to work on the inside. And we, as we painfully learned in the DOD, um, you know, the inside needs to be protected as well. You need to have some standardization. You need to have the ability to um, maintain continuous diagnostics and mitigation of your uh, assets. So our department has uh, taken the lead, uh, working with GSA, OMB, and others and we created the CDM program, Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation. We let a contract through uh, GSA with a blanket purchase agreement that uh, it's up to about $6 billion on authorities. And by the way, I don't have $6 billion. I mean, that's the cap on the uh, BPA. Um, but we're, what we're doing is, is we are working on the inside as well as on that boundary with uh, off-the-shelf, state-of-the-art tools that are going to do four main things at the strategic level. One is this, we got to speak a common language. So we've picked a common dashboard, so we're all looking at the same type of things and uh, characterizing and prioritizing together. Two is this, we got to manage what's on our networks, manage the endpoints. Many of you who talk to me out in the hall uh, know very much about this, and some are actually vendors uh, for the CDM. But we've got to make sure that we have positive control of what's on your network. Know what's plugged in and know its configurations. We're using off-the-shelf tools to do that and standardize across the departments and agencies. The next phase is, is you got to manage who's on your network and what they're doing. You know, we, how many times have we had problems with too, too many folks having privileged access who aren't trained, who don't know what they're doing? How many folks we've seen exceed least privilege uh, rules, requirements, and like? You need to have positive control as to who's on your network and what they're doing. And then the last part of CDM is this, you need to be able to manage events. I like to uh, view our organization, and uh, you know, I take personal pride in being the captain of the National Cyber Neighborhood Watch. We need to be able to share information at machine <coughs> speed as opposed to you know, waiting months about information and sharing events. We are truly in a cyber neighborhood watch uh, mode where we need to be working together to share uh, information and to manage events so that if I see something, I say something, and you can adapt your defenses based upon the information I give you. That's a quick rundown on what we're doing in the federal government for boundary as well as on the inside, but there's also good news too for state, local, tribal, and territorial governments because we wrote the blanket purchase agreement so that they can participate in CDM as well, and they can buy off of that contract. And so far, we've uh, uh, realized a cost avoidance of about 35% because we're buying in bulk. And uh, the only one who buys more in bulk than we do is Santa Claus. So back to you, Jim. <laughs> That's great to set the scene. Uh, thank you, Greg. Ryan, I want to send this next question over to you. Um, you know, if you have the thesis that people are our most valuable asset, in particular, these officers and key personnel in the government with top secret clearances, how the heck did we get in a position that this information was left with OPM, which from an outsider didn't look to have the mission, the organization, or the resources to manage this data appropriately. Can you give us your thoughts on that? Sure, it's an important question. Um, so you, your question starts with mission, organization, and capability. Um, I, I think it's tough to say that any one department or agency in the federal government um, had the mission, organization, and capability to adequately defend against all APTs. And I think we, we don't need to look any further than NSA. And you know, I think a lot of us spent a lot of time in the yeah. White House Situation Room after the, the Snowden <laughs> event. And, and those guys certainly had the mission, 
They've got tens of thousands of people um, and a lot of big brains over there, but, but their networks weren't adequately defended from an insider threat. Uh, so I, I think the way we need to look at this is we need to identify what's of value on our networks and OPM. Yeah. Uh, that was personnel information. Uh, I think we probably all had SF-86 that were lost, so that's uh, all of our background. I still haven't gotten my letter. So we've got credit card letter? services. I haven't got my letter I got yet. my letter. I got so, two. You got two? <laughs> yeah. You should Maybe give one to him. Mine. I got one for general and one for mister. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think we need to identify what is of value on, on federal networks on an agency by agency basis and across agencies and then apply that, that people, process and technology um, and, and drive resources and solutions um, to the things that matter the most. So you, you can't boil the ocean, but you've got to identify what matters most and then you've got to put preventative technologies in place first and then you've got to move to detect and remediate informed by that protection um, so that you can um, do a better job of protecting our crown jewels. And that there's not going to be one solution to that, and there isn't a single technology. Um, the authenticated user problem is, is very different than yeah. the signature-based perimeter defenses, which you know, we can get into later, but I think Andy Osmond says best, are necessary but insufficient. Mm -hmm. um, I want to dig on this question a little bit more about back to OPM. Your point's granted that it could happen anywhere, and we'll, we'll come back to that. But maybe for either you or for Greg, um, up front, did we know the magnitude of the risk and who knew up front and what did we talk about? Like what was known and discussed with regard to the, the risk at OPM? I, I could start there. Yeah. Um, I, I think um, we commonly see that there, there wasn't um, either on an agency basis or cross government prioritization. So the, the implementation plan that just came out of the White House yep. calls for that. So I, I think, you know, going back several years, um, had the government done that type of assessment, yeah. had they identified the, the real value that was resident on those networks, um, I, I think ideally we could have been in a better place. But uh, the OPM situation developed in a couple of stages. So um, there was a point almost a year ago where both the value was identified and the weaknesses were identified. I think it's safe to say OPM was moving in a direction uh, to take steps to the DHS mitigation plan that had been recommended. Yep. Um, I think those steps were fast for government and wholly <coughs> insufficient, obviously, for the threat that they faced right. and the value that resided on their networks. Kevin, question for you. Um, if we could rewind the tape, um, apply sort of the, the strategy lens that you deal with every day, what questions should OPM or the oversight should have asked up front before we got here? What would be a better framework or a mindset to look at this? Yeah, and so uh, we actually talked a little bit about this last night, and, and I agree with Ryan that, that you, there was a risk assessment. You understood the magnitude. You were starting to understand the magnitude. I think one of the big ones that I think people haven't gotten their arms around is the velocity of, of what's going to happen and how quickly. You know, if we think through uh, the myriad of, of response capabilities, I saw a table on this a couple of days ago, and you know, you've got a hurricane, you've got a tornado, and you've got cyber. So I've got days, hours, and nanoseconds. And I think organizationally, people believe that they, they're good counterpunchers. They believe that they can react and respond at speed with the adversary. And I think in, a, in a, maybe a traditional set of combat, you could maybe measure that. I don't think people have really gotten their head around milliseconds and nanoseconds. Uh, and they believe that, well, we've got all this infrastructure. Isn't someone doing it? No, not at, not at that level. So, so ultimately, in addition to do we know what the magnitude of the exposure is, do we really know what this means to the <laughs> lives of the 20 million or ho however many it ends up being, what this means to these individuals as they have to go recreate credit and the, the hardship that they're going to go through? If that were put on, on the stage with that, the probability of something bad, and I think we've heard this morning it's essentially 100%, but it's, there's some scale. We have a magnitude uh, of how bad it's going to be. Then there's the velocity piece. If you put those three together, I, I think people are, are going to make different decisions. They really have a visceral understanding of how bad it could really have been. So, so you know, we talk about, well, we didn't have the budget. Well, every big project that I've ever done on the private sector side has been unbudgeted. If it's important, you figure out how to do it. You find the money to do it right. If, if that were uh, a weapon of mass destruction that we were defending against, we would have found money all over the place. Hmm. 
people don't understand the, the magnitude is almost is, is devastating in a, in a certain way. Obviously not lives lost, but as far as the impact to, to, to the society or the group at, at right. hand. Greg. Yeah, I think I, I agree wholeheartedly with both Ryan and Kevin's comments. And I think you know, one of the things that, uh, that I see from my perch in working with both public and the private sector is, is everybody's got an issue that we need to address, and it's about risk management. And when I take a look at OPM and I see breaches in the private sector as well, there's a couple of common themes that I'm seeing. And uh, the big one that comes to me is, is that we're not necessarily managing risk very well. We, can't, uh, we don't see folks that have quantified or qualified uh, risk in the cyber sector, the IT and, and the like. And further, when we are doing risk uh, assessments, we're not managing at the right level. And within the federal government, you know, we have a certification and accreditation process. There's processes that are out there that are well documented within the federal government standards and the like. But often those acceptance of risk and the certification and accreditation is, is done at lower levels. And we're not taking a look at uh, the aggregated risk, the roll up at the most senior levels and the like. And as, we take, as we've taken a look at this, I think this, uh, this new effort that uh, we're undertaking across the federal level with the Cybersecurity Strategy Implementation Plan is rightfully taking a look at better managing the risk and managing it at the right level. And while we're doing that in the federal side, I think private industry needs to be taking a look at their risk management procedures when it comes to information and information technologies as well to make sure that risk is properly addressed at the, at the right level and it's done in, in accordance with the organization's risk appetite. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Mark, over to you on this one. I, I think the point that this could have happened anywhere is sort of table stakes, that's a given. But, but Mark, I wanna build on a conversation you and I have had earlier, which is, is there anything structural within the government and maybe a ranking of this, whether it's leadership or procurement or any of the other contributing causes that we need to sort of surface and fix? E, all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think certainly the procurement um, issue is, is one of the biggest challenges that the government has, both at the federal and the state and local side. And I think Greg would agree with me on this. Um, you know, Moore's law still applies in technology. And when you start a procurement process that takes multi years to implement and deploy, um, the technology has. Uh, certainly changed over that Moore's Law period of time. So um, I, I think, you know, and it, probably not the forum to, to get in this, but real reform needs to, be ha needs to happen in federal government acquisition, or we are never going to solve this problem. I, um, I would agree. I, it, we're using the same mechanisms for buying ships and airplanes as I, we are for computers. Yep. And I read somebody did a report on this a few years ago, said that it was an 80 month cycle. Um, between the time somebody has an idea that we have to buy something and the time that it's being installed. I don't think it's quite that long in IT, um, but of course if you look at Einstein, maybe perhaps it is. Um, but uh, the, the other thing I wanted to point out was, was what Greg said was about risk management. And you know, those of us that have been in the security business for any length of time, we've been saying this forever, that this is really a risk issue. And um, Chris Blast has a, has a quote that I, I use often. He says, um, we need to identify our critical assets and protect them like a prisoner in solitary confinement. And we are not doing that. Um, we aren't doing it. If we, would have been, if we would have done this, OPM wouldn't have happened. And I posit that you could go to any government organization, federal government organization, you go to any private sector organization, you know, and, and our job at, at the Chertop Group is we advise clients um, go into many organizations and you say, what is the one thing that if you lost it today or was compromised today that would put you out of business? A lot of CEOs can't answer that question. And I find that absolutely baffling. And I would say that you could go to federal government agencies and go to the secretaries or go to the directors and ask them that same question. And they probably couldn't answer that question from an IT. What is the one IT thing in your organization that if you lost it would show up on the front page of the Washington Post tomorrow. Um, so I think, you know, this is a risk issue. We need to 
really identify what our critical assets are because we're never going to be able to protect them unless we know that. I want to come back, Ryan, to a talk we were having about um, acquisition and as it relates to risk, but not risk management. It's taking risk. Um, because it's, it's great we're talking about the acquisitions broken. What needs to change? Let's get a couple specifics. Sure. So um, the first is a greater integration of operational test and evaluation. We need to move away from this RFI paper-based checkbox of input requirements and move to outputs. Um, how, how do your various pieces of technology work together in an automated way to reduce the risk to your network? That is something that is absolutely not done well in the federal government. It's something that we see um, from my company with uh, private sector clients that are willing to um, put our technology in a passive manner onto their networks, see what is going on in their networks, give them visibility that they did not have before, and see things that could be prevented. Overwhelmingly, those corporate clients that, that go through that exercise become, they go from prospective customers to customers. The government is, uh, has authority to do that through NIST. Uh, I am not aware of a CIO or CISO that is, is willing to take that risk, and I, I don't fully blame them either because I, I think you've got Congress looking over your shoulder. You know, you look at that OPM IG report, and it was 80 to 90 percent OPM didn't protect, OPM didn't protect, OPM didn't protect, and then it was OPM moved too fast with its contracting mechanism. So what you're left with is shut down your system for three years. And, and then move through a slow acquisition process. So we need to find the, the right balance of risk here so that we're moving towards A, output focused and operations, not just inputs, um, and, and moving away from the, this traditional slow cycle. I, you know, to, I'd like to just hop back to your earlier question too about structural problems within the government. Yep. You, know, you look at Einstein two and three in particular, um, there are tremendous procedural barriers to deploying known good ideas. Yeah. It took years to deploy Einstein 2 because uh, department and agency to department and agency would say, oh, I don't know if I can put DHS uh, procured technology on my network. Yeah. In the meantime, they lacked IDS capability. Now uh, with Einstein 3, it's been a big conversation with the ISPs and then the same conversation on a department and agency level, can I put your protective technologies here? All of that leads to massive delay that jeopardizes the operation of, of, of your networks. And I, I would say in, in the course of that, and I don't mean to, to badger, because I was at DHS and you know I was doing what Greg was doing just a couple of years ago. And they're great people there working on really hard problems. But when a process takes this long, when an Einstein process takes this long and that we're in 2015 and it's deployed and 49% of the agencies, you really have to ask yourself, what is, what, it's these structural problems that Ryan's talking about that are keeping this from being deployed. The technology is available today. Um, and, you know, it, it, this is what's troubling, I think, to most of us is that we have the ideas, we have the technology, but the bureaucracy is holding us back. Well, and, and I'll, I'll just dogpile on all of that. Uh, <laughs> You know, we, um, we want to make sure that we maintain the integrity of an acquisition system that is fair and transparent. I'll say that right up front. However, uh, you know, I, uh, I agree wholeheartedly with uh, Ryan and uh, with Mark's comments about uh, it takes too darn long. And, uh, and, and particularly when the national security is at risk, I get very impatient with it. And I hearken back to my time as, a, uh, as an airman. And I remember seeing the statement of work that the uh, Signal Corps put out for the very first airplane. Um, it was four pages long, and oh, by the way, you can go into your favorite search engine and go look for that statement of work, it's online. Four pages, and the Wright brothers delivered within four months of the issuing of the statement of work. So we went for statement of work, selection of vendor and delivery of product for the very first military airplane in a four-month period. How are we doing now? Can we do better? I think we can. And I, frankly, I think the nation needs to. Coming back to this question on the, the structural piece, it's in listening to you guys, it, it, you make a compelling point. You said, hey, it could happen anywhere. OPM is not the only agency that didn't have the the manpower or the capability to defend against this, is it time for a broader reset? 
that maybe we pull cyber out of all the individual agencies and components and look at more of a shared services organization. The, the new White House uh, cyber implementation plan made some hints of that and some things that may be coming. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Is there a broader reset that's needed in terms of how to deal with this? Can I jump on that one first? You're close you to me. Swing you guys are swing away. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, we do need to change the way we do business, I believe. And it starts, I think, uh, with uh, the architecture. You know, within the Department of Defense, I was part of the, uh, the effort there. It took us about 10 years to get our attack surface down to 10 internet uh, peering points. It took us about 10 years. And uh, right, right now, we've got on the uh, dot .mil, we have a more defensible attack surface. Mm. But within the federal government, uh, we continue to have uh, widespread, independently owned and operated franchises. I think the appetite is there now, and uh, s sitting in the federal CIO council, we're having those discussions about better leveraging managed services. And uh, you know, my personal view is, is CIOs, and having been a federal CIO, CIOs should be focusing on the application layer, and then everything else down could be uh, managed services. And further, hosting platforms and common core services, I think the opportunity space is there where the technology is in place, where we need to uh, pool our resources and reduce our attack surface. That will enable us to better manage our defensive perimeter and provide better uh, customer service. We'll be more agile in delivering capabilities and we'll be able to better manage our risk. Mark, I know you're chomping at the bit on this one. <laughs> well, I didn't know if you were going to ask this question or not. Um, <laughs> I have kind of a controversial approach, I think, and, and I think corporate America has gone in this direction. And, and I'm not saying just because corporate America is doing it that it's good for the federal government, but, but I think it's worth a, a thought. And that is, today, if you think, and I don't know what this number is, you look, think about all the different federal agencies and departments and boards and councils and commissions. All of these different federal organizations, there's hundreds of them, and each one of them has their own security staff, mm -hmm. their own security budget, their own security architecture, their own security policies, falling loosely after FISMA. But the, these are replicated hundreds of times across different agencies in the federal government. There is no possible way that we're ever going to see any consistency in security with all of this duplication of effort. So my controversial idea is that we begin, I think Greg was kind of going down this road, we begin consolidating and aggregating um, security governance, security control in the federal government, perhaps not in a single federal agency, but in a smaller number of federal agencies. Um, because we're, we're simply never going to be able to get our arms around this problem with, the, with such disparate governance. So I have a, I have a slightly different take. Um, not, not complete disagreement, but I think there are absolutely things that could be centralized better. I think there are between cloud technology, <coughs> between reducing the attack surface, you talked about the DOD side, that's the, the same process that is underway in the federal civilian government under the trusted internet connection. Um, so I, I think there are absolutely ways where you can centralize, find efficiencies, and also move from personnel intensive jobs right now to automate more efficiently so that you can focus your personnel on things that, that matter most and require people's attention as opposed to wasting time on uh, following up on alerts that they don't need to be spending their time on. Um, with that said, you're, I don't think you're ever going to remove the reality that um, cybersecurity is always going to be a shared responsibility across the government and public to private. So there are things that we can centralize better, but I think you're always going to need to have some level of risk management on an agency by agency basis. Mm -hmm. I think you need to have a security staff to a certain extent. I think that you can avoid duplication. I think that those can be small and nimble staffs designed in the right way. But I do think you've got to have this, this central focus across the government and, and frankly across the ecosystem where there is a culture of cybersecurity that permeates all departments and agencies. The question is how do you just make sure that, that those departments and agencies where their core mission is in cybersecurity are focusing on a, on a discrete set of tasks that are unique to them. And I, I would actually say even you know, on the, the example of each department and agency has a cybersecurity staff or an IT staff, I actually think what you have in a lot of places, you've got a security group, you've got a network group, you've got app managers. So you're actually got 
three to five sets of people that potentially are buying overlapping or duplicative technologies, oftentimes not with the focus of um, the overall risk management to the organization. They're focused on their own myopic view of the world and what their core responsibilities are. Um, what that leads to is a less efficient system that, that doesn't work well from a budgetary or an operational perspective. Kevin, I want to go to you on this one. Thank you, Ryan. Um, you guys have had to have deal with this in industry. What are some best practices on this topic of silos, independent versus shared services? What lessons can we learn there? So uh, a few things. First is as, as you put this on the agenda, the role of protecting the cyber interest of an organization has to go higher up. Uh, this isn't uh, an administrator level Mm -hmm. uh, accountability. This needs to be at an executive level. This needs to be formative on that, that risk agenda. I've got my financial risk. I've got my reputational risk. I've got my cyber risk, and this is, this is important. So it needs to be bubbled up to be people of, of materiality to the organization can, can actually impact change. Um, it's interesting. Centralization is happening in private industry all over the place, and shadow IT is growing by orders of magnitude. Mm. Depending on what numbers you yeah. look at, it's somewhere between 45 to 55 percent of the IT landscape is happening out of band of the CIO because it was just too darn hard. It was too darn expensive. It wasn't, it wasn't agile enough for me to do my job, so I just did it myself, maybe cheaper, <laughs> more expensively, what have you, but it's creating exposure all over the, all, all over the place. I think that there are financial benefits for shared services. Why, why do we really need to have 55 relationships with pick the vendor? Let's consolidate. Um, but then recognize that people have a charter and they're going to go do their, do their job to hit their charter the most convenient and, and uh, most effective way possible. And every time a wall gets put up, they're going to find a way around it. So I think you have to kind of balance the cost savings and, and benefits of centralization and recognize that people still need to do their job. And, and that's, the, that's that harmonious balance that is a bit evasive that we're trying to go after. Let me change topics. Thank you on that. I want to talk about CISA for a minute. Um, you know, from where I live out in Silicon Valley, some view this as a one-way street. We send information to the government, and that's it. Um, Greg, can you talk a little bit more about how DHS is going to actually take the industry information, synthesize it, turn it back quickly, and then the second part is how do we get the good stuff, those TTTs, TTCs and IOCs of sort of the, the, the anonymized confidential sort of government signatures? Well, I would submit that you're already getting the stuff, but uh, here's why you may think that you're not. You know, I, I like to use the analogy of the neighborhood watch. And, uh, you know, frankly, um, today we're having a, a meeting of the cyber neighborhood watch right here. You know, we're all part of a, uh, uh, a planned uh, community here, right? We all got houses here in the neighborhood represented by you. There's the uh, gated community. We'll call that our internet access point, that's the analogy. But if there's a guy like Greg who comes into the neighborhood, he's driving a 1998 green Toyota Sienna minivan. He comes in between 11 and 2 every afternoon. He's casing the joint, and then he goes in and breaks into Jim's house. And uh, oh, by the way, when he's in Jim's house, he goes and he gets all of the uh, electronics, by the way, nice 4K TV, really like that. Um, and your <laughs> computer systems, really nice. And Oh, by the way, that was a really cute dog. I, uh, I like that one, too. My kids really enjoy that. Do you need to know, oh, and oh, by the way, I was able to defeat the lock on your front door. That's how I got in. Do you as the neighbors need to know that it was Jim's house that got broken into or the inventory of all the stuff that Greg took? Or is it more valuable as part of the neighborhood to know that that lock on that front door, oh, by the way, the builders, your houses are all different, but the builder probably went to the same lock guy. You may have the same lock on your front door. Let's just say that lock was made in Redmond, Washington, for example. Wouldn't you want to know that that lock could be defeated so that you could take compensating controls? Get like a new deadbolt, an alarm system, maybe an armed guard if you're assets are so valuable. And wouldn't it be valuable to know that the assailant is a guy who's uh, a little over six feet tall, brown hair, bloodshot eyes, drives green uh, Toyota minivan, and he's going to be in the neighborhood between 11 and 2. So what we're doing in DHS is, is we're sharing information about the assailants. We're sharing the tactics, techniques, and procedures that we hear about, but we're anonymizing it. We're not telling you about Jim. 
we're telling you about Greg. And what, where do we do that? We do it through a lot of different mechanisms, but you can go to our website at www.us-cert, as in cert, dot gov. And we post stuff out on the US CERT website. We have subscription service, so we'll push out RS, you know, through an RSS feed. We have collaboration forums. We have a program called CISP, C-I-S-C-P. Stands for uh, Cyber Security Information Sharing and Collaboration Program, where we broaden the conversation more than just the email sharing. We actually bring folks in that uh, have security clearances and we share classified information. We have regular, regularly uh, scheduled meetings for our partners. Uh, we even went out on a road show uh, last year when I was the NCIC director. We, we went out to 13 different cities talking about some very specific industrial control system threats mm -hmm. that we were seeing. We're now even uh, recognizing that most folks don't respond to emails as fast as they do text messaging, so we're looking at, uh, during this year, getting that text alert, hey, you've got something coming in from uh, CISP. We are, in fact, sharing information. We want to get it to, uh, to folks, and uh, we're also doing automated indicator sharing through Stixon's taxi format so that we can go from months to milliseconds and share to those companies who have the capability to ingest that information at machine speed. But we also have to recognize that we've got small and medium businesses, homeowners and the like, people throughout the country that need that information and we have various means of getting that out. But you will never get something that says, okay, Here's something directly attributed to this breach here. Right. Here's something directly attributed to this breach here. Because we want to preserve the brands, the reputations, the privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties of our people and uh, the businesses there. Thank you. Mark? Um, so I agree with everything that Greg said. And you know what DHS is doing is, is phenomenal. But the success of, or failure of an information sharing program, and CISA specifically, is really, I think, is going to be dependent upon not necessarily what the government is sharing, but what the private sector is asking for. Um, because the government often has misperceptions of what the private sector, what the customer wants. Um, so you need to be very attuned to being able to answer the questions of what they are actually looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll give you a specific example of that. Um, in the uh, DDoS attacks on the financial sector, um, initially what was being pushed out from the government was IP addresses and it didn't have date and time stamps. Um, the recipients in the private sector and the financial community said, uh, that's great, but it's actually not useful because these attackers are hopping from IP address to IP address. So what we need are date and time stamp context to go with the IP address. So I think that that two-way conversation to make sure that uh, the government is understanding of what's most useful and what the data sets are is, is absolutely important. Um, I, I also agree, agree DHS and FBI and uh, the rest of the government is, is doing a better job in pushing information out. Um, we absolutely utilize those guys. For example, we, um, our threat intelligence team found a vulnerability in, in Android devices. We worked with Android to make sure that they had a mediation in place. Then we worked with DHS who put up an alert, not crediting us, but alerting their community of stakeholders so that there's a, a broad platform to push out that information to make sure that network defenders across public and private sector had that information to defend their own networks and were putting remediation in place. Um, I, I think what we're looking at in the legislation is an attempt to facilitate the scope and scale and automation of that type of sharing. And so there are different privacy implications when you move towards these type of, of real-time and near real-time sharing. Um, so privacy becomes important, but I think also the, the extent to which we can increase the, the players that are involved in sharing this type of information, the real value that the government is going to be add, in addition to the platform that they have and the audience, is um, they're going to have more information about what is out there that they can correlate most likely to highly classified information that otherwise they're not able to declassify and send unclassed tear lines out on. That, that is a huge problem that the government has right now and receiving more information and context about those actor sets that they could push out. They could say, I can't tell you how I got this information, but we've seen it across the private sector, and you need to protect against this. This is what matters a lot. That's where the real value is going to end up coming from, from information sharing. Yeah, I'd like to just jump on the uh, classification. Uh, 
thing. You know, we've been working very closely with uh, law enforcement and the intelligence community to put special emphasis on declassifying information as fast as possible. We have a lot of companies that come to us and say, hey, we would like to go and invest in a classified infrastructure so we can get that secret sauce stuff that you have. And the vast majority of stuff that we have is not the secret sauce, not signals mm. intelligence and the like. And further, we did a study that took a look at the signals intelligence and how long is it between the time of receipt until the time you get it on the internet. And we've reached an agreement with our uh, partners that when it's in the, in the, uh, on the internet, it's when it's in the public, we're gonna put it out. And we're not going to hold on to it and we are working across the government to declassify as fast as possible so that we can get the information out across as wide a variety of folks as possible because we recognize it comes with a cost to set up a classified infrastructure and the vast majority of American business can't afford it. And we can't afford to hold on to information. We need to get it out to uh, actionable and timely a manner as possible. So we're working together to uh, declassify as fast as we can. Last question, guys, quickly. I want to hit this 30 seconds, each of you guys. I think um, Einstein and CDM have been described as necessary but insufficient. What else do we need? 30 seconds, each one of you guys down the list. Whoever wants to jump in first. Start. Yeah, I'll start. Uh, trained workforce from the top on down. <laughs> we need senior executives to look at uh, cybersecurity as a risk issue and run their organizations as good leaders and managers should from the top on down, make sure that the people that are managing that risk for them are well trained and know what to do and know what the priorities are. Um, go back and uh, acquisition and procurement. We have to fix the acquisition and procurement. Um, and we need to be uh, taking more advantage of private sector technology. You know, and, and I will uh, we'll use um, Einstein as a, as, a, as a bit of an example here. Um, I almost guarantee you 100% that if you went to any major private sector company and said, build me an Einstein, they could do it much quicker and at a lot less cost than what the government is spending for Einstein today. I think that the new legislation has $2.5 billion budgeted for the Einstein 3 over the next five years. Um, that's a lot of dough to build a, a, a piece of technology that probably exists in 90% in its current, current form somewhere in the private sector today. Ryan. People processing technology like we've been talking about, we need to improve in all those areas. Um, the implementation plan that just came out of the White House, um, we need to stop coming up with these new ideas and execute on the things that we've put out there. So there's, there's <laughs> actual <laughs> deadlines and metrics in there for entities to, to comply with. Um, I think it's great that they've tapped deputy secretaries uh, to be personally responsible for those things. The White House needs to keep bringing in these agency heads and make sure that they are holding entities accountable to implement. On the Einstein and CDM, um, I, I th I'd say two things. We need to look at the capabilities that they are intended to to apply, so with Einstein, it's signature-based and it's at the perimeter. Are, are, as we implement, are what we're deploying, are those the most effective technologies to accomplish those identified mission sets? And what are the requirements that are not included in signature-based perimeter defense? So that's heuristics, network segmentation, making sure that you are yeah. preventing across the kill chain and not just at the perimeter. Good. Kevin. Uh, so in addition to training, uh, executive understanding, uh, understanding of the magnitude of what's really there, um, and then accountability to impact change at the right level. I think right now we're, the, people are dealing with this as this is an IT problem. It's not an IT problem. It's a business and an organizational problem yes. yep. that just happens to have an IT delivery mechanism. Great. So moving it up the stack. Yep. All right, Mark, you said one more. So this is going to cost I, I you. Just, this, I want to give a shout out. Um, Tony Scott at, at the federal CIO is doing some things that nobody in the federal government in the executive branch has ever done. And you know, you know, when he first came out with this 30-day sprint idea, I thought, well, it's a good idea, a little hokey sounding. But you know what, we really need to support him because he is actually going to, what he's doing, what he's talking about, I think is driving change in the federal government. And the administration really needs to support him. Great, we are blowing through our time. Thank you guys. Questions, we have time for a few. Hi, I'm 
Greg Otto uh, from FedScoop. A question for Mr. Tuwa. I'd like you to clarify something just because I, I haven't heard it said before. With Einstein 3A, you said that it was 15 years, uh, we needed it 15 years ago, or is the technology at this point 15 years old? There's been intr uh, intrusion protection or, uh, systems out there that date back uh, 15 years and beyond. So. Uh, what I was saying is, is that 15 years ago, it would have been considered state of the art. So whether it's from DHS, Tony Scott, OMB, or the president himself, why hasn't there been more of a push to say, let's get this on, you know, closer to state of the art now there, instead of? There is. So that's one of the things that we've been doing with the, uh, the new strategy. We've been, uh, it's been a push. I tell you what, my secretary has personally been engaged with all the different secretaries across the, uh, the departments and agencies. The thing about it, too, is um, the Einstein system collectively is the only system that gives situational awareness across all the different departments and agencies. One thing that we don't want to do is, is have everybody go off on their own and have you know, their own discrete view because having that broader view, as, as every military guy knows, you want to see the whole battle space. And Einstein uh, with a one, two, and three gives us the only visibility across the entire battle space at the perimeter. But as we had it during our discussion, we need to go further. We need to work on the inside of the wire it's, itself with yep. CDM. And then we also need to work the human elements, the organizational structures, the architectures, and the like. And as Mark said, I think the initiatives that Tony Scott has been really grabbing the flag and leading forward is, are going to have a huge return on investment. Next question. Sir. So uh, no, uh, Gavin Baker, the chair of um, No conversation about cybersecurity, particularly in government, is complete without uh, without talking about the need for uh, acquisition reform and, and changing the zero risk model of acquisitions. So uh, 10, 15 years, we've been having the same discussion. Um, are we actually making any progress? And in and, and what areas are we making progress? Do you want to do that one? I don't think so. <laughs> it's certainly not on a government-wide scale. You know, I think it's encouraging that DOD is setting up this new um, Enterprise DIUX out at Moffett Air Force Base yeah. out in the Valley. DHS also going out to the Valley yeah. as well. Um, whether or not that is leading to new effective capabilities delivered to the hands of network defenders faster, <laughs> I, I think it's, it's too early to see that, certainly on a systematic level. You know, and I've got over 30 plus years of experience in the uh, in federal government on the dot mill as well as the dot gov side of the house. I think the answer to your question can be uh, summed up with the size and heft of the federal acquisition regs. I double dog dare you to bench press them. <laughs> Anybody else? We may have time for one more. Okay. That looks like that's it. We're between uh, them and lunch, so. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, a couple things. First <laughs> off, um, to the panelists, you guys were awesome. Um, thank you very much. So a round of applause for the panel. Uh, just a couple things about lunch. Um, out the doors, take a left, down the hall, you'll see it, you'll smell it. Um, if you could uh, grab your plates, I, I think um, in the start of the day we talked about this program, Birds of a Feather. Um, you probably know the drill on this. The idea is to meet some new people, continue the conversation. Um, you can look through the insert in the handout where the tables are. If you really don't want to do that, there's a couple of tables that don't have anything on them. That's fine. But um, I can say from past Security Series events, this has been a cool part of the day. So uh, pick a table, join the conversation. Next session starts at 1.10. Thank you very much.